to all of you and um, start this special day um, with a new impetus for parity is a great symbol. And I think that um, maybe it can be an historic uh, side event. I hope so. I hope so for each of us. I hope so for the world and uh, for peace, for security, and uh, for a better and sustainable development. Um, I would like just, um, first of all, to, to thank the panelists uh, who are participating in this event. First of all, all of you. And I know <coughs> that there is a parliamentarian uh, from different countries, Canada, Pakistan, Lebanon, but also, of course, NGOs. And uh, it's, uh, it's a great meeting with, uh, with you. And um, we have uh, at the table, um, first, uh, Mexico. The ambassador is coming right now. And I would like to congratulate this uh, gender champion. Because uh, Mexico is the leader of the coalition of leadership uh, in the forum Generation Equality. And we are working with the forum Generation Equality. And, uh, also, of course, uh, it's uh, a country which has a parity parliament. And I must say that uh, there is so few countries in the world today uh, having such a good example that uh, we have to note. And it is one of the leaders of the group of states, friends of the GR40, of the CEDO committee. And I must say that uh, uh, Mexico, together with uh, France, Netherlands, Canada, Australia, uh, Emirates, uh, will be uh, leaders with us for this new recommendation. And uh, uh, I just say that you were gender champion. <laughs> yes, I was. And I have been and I will always be. <laughs> exactly, and you are so close to CEDAW uh, yes. committee. Yes. So thank you to be there. Thank, thank you for the example, wonderful example that you give to the world. And uh, we know that the, the day is very busy for all the ministers and ambassadors, and so we appreciate yes. that. Um, I would like also, of course, uh, uh, congratulate and welcome Mrs. Lia Kartpelle. Uh, I hope my yes, you did. pronunciation is good. <laughs> Member of the IPU Committee on the Human Rights of Parliamentarians um, from Italy. And uh, we know your brilliant uh, career and also your responsibility on violences. And uh, the link between violences and AI will be very uh, important. So um, we are very uh, uh, interested in your participation today. And of course, Mariana Duarte, uh, everybody knows this uh, brilliant uh, lady in charge of IPU. She, she does uh, everything. Uh, and uh, she's really extraordinarily efficient because we have a partnership between CEDO and IPU. And it is uh, uh, thanks uh, to, to Mariana. And um, Mrs. Ashrafun Nahar Misti, Executive Director of the, Human, of the Women with Disabilities Development Foundation, a member of the Coalition of Action uh, in the, in, within the Forum of Generation Equality. And it is a great honor for us to, to have her on board. Let me start uh, also by thanking IPU and UN Women for the R. You, you are there. Thank you very much. And, uh, I was just saying that uh, uh, you were the executive director uh, of the Women with Disabilities Development Foundation. Welcome and thank you again. Um, IPU and UN Women, uh, together with the CEDO committee, have organized uh, this uh, side event at the occasion of the launching of the new GR40 on the equal and inclusive representation of women in all decision-making systems. Um, let me just uh, uh, say three remarks. Um, the lesson learned from COVID crisis, as well as the global challenges that we face nowadays, climate change, migration, poverty, conflicts, 
insecurity, but also um, extremism, call for a new impetus in terms of parity. And uh, the CEDAW con committee considers that uh, the commitments made also in the framework of the uh, 2030 agenda, the rise of artificial intelligence, all these factors and disruptive evolutions challenge our systems and create a momentum for a paradigm shift. The de facto exclusion of women from decision-making system is one of the worst violations of human rights. Everywhere uh, in the world, women, uh, women, uh, women, the first victims of violence, conflict, and discrimination. When they are, in the meantime, the drivers of change. And uh, they have to be seen as such they unfortunately remain absent from decision-making process and cannot decide for their own rights, nor for their country, nor for the world. This uh, GR aims to provide a new legal framework for effective parity in politics, public and economic life in order to move from a cause to a norm. And I must say that as parliamentarian in 1999, I have uh, contributed to integrate parity in the Constitution, and we have encore this principle. And after that, we have opened a decade, and as minister, I have uh, made a lot of laws for the elections, for the, uh, the reform of ballots, to uh, implement this principle. So we have now to change our view considering the, uh, maybe the constitutional approach about parity. And I would like to finish uh, saying that it's no more an, op an option, and we have really to consider, despite success stories, and there are very good examples in the world, despite good practices, despite a strong consensus, we have really to consider that the level of women, parliamentarian women, of course, too, too low. And the evolution uh, is random. Sometimes we know pushbacks, even in uh, some countries. Uh, and it's not, unfortunately, uh, a very, very um, rare uh, example we have uh, sometimes in the CEDAW committee to, cons to, to observe uh, strong pushbacks. So this GR will start, uh, I've already started, and it is a very important day, but um, <coughs> we elaborate this, um, this work over the next two years, and we will associate all the NGOs, of course, but also state parties, but also private sector, and uh, that, of course, IPU and UN women we are, uh, were the co-leaders of this uh, uh, new uh, recommendation. I just want to say that uh, I have three key words in, uh, in mind. First, acceleration. We cannot stay at this level. We cannot wait for new decades. We have to act now, and we have to change the system now. It is a systemic uh, challenge. Secondly, we have to be innovative. We cannot respond to this uh, challenge with uh, old practices. Of course, some of them uh, remain very, very uh, important. But uh, uh, we are in a new context. And we have to make a link with uh, artificial intelligence, with new forms of uh, participation, uh, social inclusion. Uh, and we, um, we have to change our model. Uh, my proposal, uh, together with IPU and UN Women, is to create a new chain of values uh, for the system of decision. And third, mobilization, because uh, we need everybody. It's <coughs> probably one of the most important time in uh, the lives of the CEDAW committee to propose 
a new framework, a new operational roadmap, and it will be the case with this uh, GR that uh, will be adopted in October 2024. We have time to, to work on it, join the process. It's my message today. So, and uh, having said that, I would like to give the, the floor first uh, to you, Madam Ambassador, uh, for, uh, I have no idea about the time, but. Uh. It's, it's gonna be short, so no worries about it. And uh, thank you very much. Good morning, colleagues, to all of you. Nicole, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I would like to thank the Interparliamentary Union, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and UN Women for organizing this important event. It is an honor to be here today. Um, in Mexico, we are convinced that the creation of an enabling environment to promote women's participation in public life and strengthening the voice, um, agency, and leadership of women and girls in all their diversity will only bring benefits for the whole society. And we know that very well. And these can help for the positive transformation of our country. So according to IPU's ranking of the percentage of women in national parliaments, Mexico is number four in the world. We have achieved gender parity in both chambers, in the, in, in the lower and in the Senate. Um, in the lower chamber, uh, we, uh, women hold 50% of the total seats, while in the Senate, their participation reaches even more, which is 50.78, almost 51%. In, addition, in addition, Mexico is one of the six countries that so far have achieved or surpassed gender, gender parity in, in, in their lower or single chambers. Now it is important to highlight the cultural change that, this, that these numbers represent in a patriarchal society. It entails that Mexican voters are looking more for women as important agents for change in society and that people are increasingly voting for women as, as well. I would like to share with you very briefly how we were able to achieve these numbers, this gender parity after decades of promoting the participation of women in political life. <laughs> well, first of all, in 1953, the right of women to vote was granted for the first time. And the next year, in 1954, the first Congresswoman of Mexico was elected. However, it was not until the 1990s that affirmative actions were undertaken and implemented. In 2011, an important constitutional reform on human rights was adopted and it made it possible to establish the principle of equality and the non-discrimination as a fundamental pillar, a non-discrimination as a fundamental <laughs> pillar of the legal framework. In 2014, so we're talking about uh, uh, less nine years ago, the obligation for political parties was established to warranty gender parity in candidacies for federal and local legislators was established. And in 2019, uh, four years ago, a constitutional reform uh, was passed that warranties gender parity in the three levels and the three branches of government, um, which was the last change that we needed at this point. This process has not been easy, and you can imagine that this has entailed a lot of effort from many, many women from society, not only from the legislative branches themselves, but also from the state, at the state level, local level, and uh, civil society has also pushed very, very hard in this regard. So the process has not been easy. This doesn't mean that we have achieved everything. This is only the very beginning. And, uh, but we know that, uh, that this entails a lot of work and that this has to be done step by step. So an important thing here is that we cannot <coughs> stop working in favor of, uh, of gender parity, not only at, uh, at, uh, at the parliament level or Congress, but, also, but at all levels. And the fact that we are here and gathered together, it's because we're supposed to share what practices have enabled us to move a little bit forward. And, uh, but I'm pretty sure that there are many examples here around the table. And uh, as I said, the process has not been easy, but every step of the way uh, counts and puts us closer to the achievement of gender parity. 
So let me conclude by emphasizing that for Mexico, gender equality, the empowerment of women and girls, and women's full, equal, and meaningful participation in public life are essential for the achievement of sustainable development and for the promotion of prosperous, just, and inclusive society. We know how women can help in terms, for example, of recovering the social tissue in our countries. And we know as well, for example, that another step to move forward is having a, a feminist foreign policy. In this regard, Mexico undertook a feminist foreign policy in 2020, and we, being, uh, we will have a side event exactly on this, on this issue. And um, so these are kind of examples that can help uh, all along the way to get uh, to the objective that we are looking for. So you can count on Mexico to continue fostering cooperation between our three branches of government and the IPU, the CEDAW, and UN Women to reach common goals. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, thank you very much for underlining that, uh, uh, of course, you need a political will, a will you need a, a legal approach, yeah. and a global vision. Exactly. And uh, it's really uh, the, the best way, and uh, thanks to IPU to, to support, to accompany also uh, all the parliaments in this, uh, mm. um, uh, in this decision. So now I give the floor to, to you, dear Lia. Um, please uh, tell us how do you see uh, the next steps in this regard uh, concerning uh, um, decision making process and maybe violence because it's a big issue for you. Well, thank you very much, Nicole, and thank you very much to the Interparliamentary Union, you and women, and the committee for this occasion to think about one very key issue, which is women representation in politics. Uh, I am really pleased to be with, here with you today uh, and in this week. Um, and I think this issue is key because um, we know that representation is a key to democracy. If people are not represented, decisions that are taken uh, do not concern them. And we've seen this, for example, during COVID, when many of us knew that COVID was taking a burden, especially on women. But since women didn't have, uh, there, there wasn't an association for tired moms <laughs> torn between uh, homework and homeworking. There wasn't an association of exhausted daughters that had to care for their parents and didn't know what to do. Governments seemed not to care. And we kept seeing these big tables of men taking generally good decisions. I cannot complain of the decision taken with COVID in my own country, but not seeing what was happening every day at every hour of the, of the day in many of our households. And so it was very important to have women parliamentarians, sometimes women ministers, that voiced these source, this sorts of concern. And so we go back to, to the issue of representation. If we are not there, the problems of the majority of the people, of humanity, are not seen. So it's very important uh, to have representation. It's very important to push for quotas in national parliaments. and. Uh, and supranational bodies, but it's not enough. Surely it's not enough. And yesterday, in the session of the IPU, we talked a lot on also how to use the voice. We know that technology, which is the key of what we are discussing here at the session of CSW, can amplify voices, and we see it every day. What happens in Iran? What happens in Afghanistan? If not for technology, we wouldn't know. Even the scarcest news that we're getting of the situation, for example, of schoolgirls in Afghanistan can be amplified by each one of us. Uh, we can give support to our sisters in Iran, thanks to technology. But technology, on the other hand, especially for women who have a political voice, can be uh, something that harms them. And we know, because 
we all use social media and we know that we get attacked much more because we're women, much more when we think about something, much more when we say something. And, and so, on the other hand, we should reflect on this aspect as well, and we should use the voice that we have to also ask for parity and for quality of the public discussion, both in the online sphere and on the offline sphere. And I really thank, in this respect, the IPU that really gave us a possibility to discuss this issue, to involve men in the discussion, to reflect on, how, on the responsibility that platforms have and on how we can legislate and we can demand for better behaviors from all of us to, re to have representation and to respect the representation. So this meeting today for, for us is a great opportunity to discuss challenges and successes towards gender parity in decision making. Today, the UN Secretary General said that we need 300 years to receive, to achieve full parity. I think it's our responsibility to make it wrong. <laughs> And uh, you are absolutely right that we have not to women back better, but women back differently. And we have to change the system. And uh, uh, consider that uh, uh, quota are, are not enough. Uh, yes. Um, now I would like to, uh, to give the floor to Mrs. Mariana Duarte, program official, gender parity uh, program uh, uh, in IPU. And uh, I would like to, to know. Uh, how you, you can facilitate much more uh, the access of women to Parliament and not protect them, but uh, install uh, a better enabling uh, environment. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And um, so now I'm going to be covering the more technical part of our discussion, which is the data that we've been collecting for many, many years. Um, some of it with young women. Can you, is the microphone on? No, not yet. Okay. Maybe, yeah. Yes. There. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, Leah. So the technical is not always on our side. Um, so, yes, just briefly kind of to set the scene and tell us, you know, a little, little bit more of where we are uh, in terms of women's participation in politics. Um, we are, we've just launched in the, yesterday the Man, Women in Politics with UN Women, and a few years earlier the, the um, report, uh, Women in Parliament, the year in review. So I'll just give you a brief overview, and you have normally still copies of those two publications in, uh, on the desk over there. They're also available on the IPU website if you want to, to dig a bit deeper. So really, just a snapshot here I wanted to share with you. So women in Parliament, we're today at 26.5%. At the time of Beijing, it was 11.3%. We're moving slowly but surely. But this is just from last year, that's just 0 0.4 point more. So that's extremely slow. The good news, no functioning parliament today in the world has zero women. And that was the case up until now. So small gains, but let's celebrate <laughs> those small gains. Uh, the other thing we'll be seeing from this report in particular is that research that we've done has found that we're seeing more diverse women in Parliament, which is certainly good news for the representation uh, of our institutions. The other good news is that the club that Mexico belongs to of gender parity or over parity uh, is now uh, of six countries with New, New Zealand uh, by-election that led it to the group of uh, gender parity countries. So that six out of 193, that's not enormous, but that shows us it's possible. Um, so the bad news, as I mentioned, 0 0.4 is very little. It's the slowest we've had in the past six years, so we're not in the acceleration that we are hoping for. So that's good to know, so we know what we need to change. Um, you mentioned 300 years, uh, well, for women in parliament, at this pace, that would be 80 years. <coughs> Well, that's two, three different generations. That's a bit scary. Um, when you look at the, the overall situation in the countries that have a functioning parliament today, um, well, one third of the lower and single chambers still have less than 30 
percent women. So certainly that's a group we want to focus on. <coughs> and some of you will recognize the countries, I'm sure. I'm looking at Lebanon <laughs> particularly. Um, in terms of regions, uh, big variations. Americas, led by Mexico and others, are, are among the leaders. They have seen quite good progress, plus 1.1 plus point compared to last year, so close to 35%. Uh, last year's gains in Colombia, particularly remarkable. Um, Europe, stagnating. Mm -hmm. uh, small countries making big gains, Malta, due to a new uh, quota law. Uh, so that should be recognized as well. Sub-Saharan Africa, pretty much the same situation as a year ago. Some uh, countries, uh, small countries, Equatorial like Guinea, Lesotho, are making big gains, so let's recognize that. But I would say last year's champion from Africa is certainly Senegal, that has a parity law that we should recognize as well. Um, Pacific, small gains, big gains in the big countries, uh, Australia in particular, historic, with an upper chamber that has more than 50% women. Um, in the Pacific Islands region, shouldn't take it for granted because up until now quite a few had sometimes zero women. Now every single parliament in the Pacific has at least one woman member. Um, Asia has been stagnant, <coughs> unfortunately. And last year, the only country in the region to apply quotas at election was, was Nepal. So maybe that's the way to go. MENA region, the only region to, saw, to see a setback. And here, I must say, um, yeah, Algeria is uh, upper chamber with only 4%. That's a disappointment. Algeria had been a leader in uh, the MENA region for, for, for many years. So progress cannot be taken for granted. And uh, I'm flagging this because we know rankings help create some sort of emulation and, and praising the good ones can help us in our advocacy. So I, I really invite you all to use the, the rankings on the map uh, to, to draw attention to your uh, colleagues in parliament and decision makers in your countries. You will see also in those publications um, where women stand in terms of uh, leadership. Certainly they are underrepresented as compared to their overall percentage in parliament. So only 22.7% of speakers of parliament today are, are women. Some countries incredibly have women uh, speakers on both chambers. So again, uh, you can recognize and celebrate and they stem different uh, continents. We have Argentina, Bahamas, Belgium, Belize, Trinidad and Tobago and the USA. We also track data for SG16 at the FEU on the chairs of committees. Um, we track five different uh, types of committees, so not so surprisingly, women um, mm. overwhelmingly occupy the, 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 the positions of chairs of gender equality committees in Parliament, 65.9%. But when it comes to the defense committee, that number drops mm -hmm. to 12, 5%. Big gains in terms of firsts in many countries. Uh, women speakers of parliament were elected in 2022 for the first time in quite a few countries. Angola, France, Monaco, Montenegro, St. Kitts and Nevis, and Slovenia. Now moving to the women executive data that's been collected from last year by, by our colleagues from Young Women uh, that you find on the map. So again, when it comes to the top, top, top leadership, <laughs> Women heads of state and heads of government hovering around 10-11%. But that's quite a big change for not so long ago when we had 5.3 and 7.3% respectively. Uh, Europe continues to have the highest number of women-led countries, 16. Now the ranking of women ministers, which is always extremely interesting. Uh, overall, uh, as for women uh, speakers, we have about uh, the same percentage for, for cabinet ministers, 22.8% overall in the countries and in the world. 13 have 50% or mm. more women cabinet members. So I'll, I'll leave the list there for you to look for the sake of time, and you will find that ranking on the map as well. Um, Women-led portfolios, women cabinet members, Lab portfolios. Um, we do see, um, as in previous years, a tendency for women ministers to occupy mostly uh, gender equality, human affairs, um, human rights, and social affairs portfolios. 
and as for committee chairs, this is similarly uh, 12% in defense uh, and 8% uh, only in transportation. So that's mm -hmm. very interesting when it comes to caring about the needs of women in terms of transport, certainly. Our lessons learned. Quotas, as we've heard before, are critical, and we have the data to prove it. In the countries that held elections last year, when quotas were applied, women were elected to 30.9% of seats. When there are no quotas, 21.2%. But quotas don't always help or are not enough. They need to be well designed. They need to be ambitious. They need to be duly implemented. And we've seen Somalia, for example, with the decrease despite the 30% quota in the law. So law, yes, but with laws and well implemented. Violence against women and peace. We've discussed that extensively yesterday. We've done a few studies, uh, the latest uh, with the African Parliamentary Union, and every single study proves that when women are in office, even if, when they are in power, they're not protected, let alone when they're not in power. Uh, over 80% of women parliamentarians we've been interviewing for the past six years say they've faced some form of psychological violence. But we're also seeing things moving. <coughs> Senegal saw uh, male MPs being sanctioned for physically attacking a, a, a pregnant uh, a colleague. Uh, we've seen um, incidents, we've seen also cases being registered. Uh, we see increases in, in incidents being registered, which in itself means that there is a system to collect them, but there's something more that parliaments can and should do, and, and you know, we're really trying our best to support and, and we've developed guidelines. And we have a committee on the horizon of parliamentarians Ms. Patapella belongs to that does receive individual complaints, so let's use those mechanisms. So to end, I, I don't want to repeat the many good reasons that we all know uh, why parity is important. Um, we also know that there are ways to achieve them. We've heard uh, many good uh, recommendations yesterday from the parliamentary meeting as well. So just to, to cite those national plans of action, this is something that the CEDAW committee we've been calling for for many years now. We need a comprehensive approach to this issue. Gender quality in the law, ending discriminatory laws, capping electoral spending, those can work quite well to level the playing field. Legislate against gender-based violence, including gender-based violence in politics, and Mexico, I think, is one of the countries that has done so. Um, targeting parity in public life across the board, not only in parliament, and mandating and financing gender mainstreaming. I'll stop there, and uh, I look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations to IPU for supporting this uh, very important issue uh, so well. Um, I would like just to, to say that um, uh, you, you, we have all uh, observed that the progress is uh, slow and the evolution is random. And uh, the reason why we have really to consolidate uh, as much as we can the parity. And I, I think that feminist diplomacy can be also a very good support uh, to reinforce the national capacities in this regard and to create a new culture of governance. And, uh, I would like to uh, thank again Mariana and uh, um, repeat that uh, for us, parity by 2030 can be the, the good uh, approach. Uh, acceleration is uh, really very important. And we have to create a sort of uh, objective, because uh, timeline, if I can say that. Because if not, uh, it's just a sort of uh, encouragement. And it's not uh, our view. Uh, we are really to to change the system rapidly if we want to be on time with the other challenges. It's my pleasure to, to give now the floor uh, to you, uh, Mrs. Ashrafun Taha Misti. You are, I repeat it, Executive Director of uh, WDDF. Uh, you have the floor, please. Is that audible? Normally no. yeah. it works. I think uh, you hear me? 
uh, the um, building the leadership capacity, building the political uh, interest in between the women uh, in different level. And um, I think that huge um, encouragement uh, to women is needed. Uh, who is, is in the developing country because in the developing country women are uh, uh, very much interested to looking uh, for their progress inside the home or institutions. They are not very willing to be part of the decision making level. So uh, there is uh, extra initiative is needed. And support for equal, safe and fair environment for the parliamentary and is also very much needed I think. so. Uh, this is uh, uh, my uh, observations and uh, thinking. I just uh, share with you. If you have any question, I can answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, can be sure that uh, inclusiveness and diversity are main values and <laughs> will be totally uh, on the forefront of this uh, GR. And uh, you are also. Uh, you are also right on the uh, capacity building because uh, we need uh, with NGOs to, to, to have a strong uh, exchange on the new contents of, of our uh, um, uh, sensibilization and uh, I think that for the time um, women issues are not considered as global issues and we are ready to move to a strategic view about, about uh, this uh, this point. Um, now we open the floor for questions. I have a, a specific uh, uh, demand from uh, the representatives of uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan. Please. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Azara Kamnashanovna. I am member of Parliament of Kyrgyzstan. I will to present my brief report on gender equality in Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan was the first country in Central Asia region whose parliament adopted the laws on state guarantee of equivalence and equal opportunities for men and women and protection from family and violence. We also introduced five types of mandatory expertise, including gender expertise. In order to increase women's political participation, at the decision-making level, there is 30 percent quota for women in parliament and representative bodies of local self-government. There are defined special measures uh, applied to ensure representation of women and men in state bodies. Not more than 70% of persons of the sex. Particularly in court and fiscal bodies. Despite the developed gender legislation in the country, the achievement of equal equality remains problematic. The prevalence of gender-based violence further limits women from the benefits that targets women could have gained from new progressive laws. Gender equality in other spheres of life must be achieved by ending violence against women and girls, quality education, training, and lifelong learning for women and girls, including in digital technology and artificial intelligence. Equality and non-discrimination under the law, as well as access to justice. Increased opportunities for women political participation. Increased interparliamentary cooper uh, cooperation on gender issues. May I ask you to conclude rapidly because we have a lot of uh, yeah. interventions. Please. In order to create a favorable environment for the development of innovation activity taking into account the realities, the government of the Kyrgyz Republic initiated a new project of the law on innovation activity. 
the Parliament of Kyrgyz Republic is always committed to supporting legislative initiatives in the field of innovation for gender equality. At the end of my speech, I would like to note that Kyrgyz Republic will continue to work actively within the framework of the accepted international commitments. Membership in the DAO, the goals of Beijing Platform for Actions, as well as the Thank you. We, Thank you for your attention. I, I'm, I'm sorry because we really we, we have to, to, to stop now. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and, uh, we are great. And, uh, but before uh, to give the floor to, to the uh, parliamentarian from Lebanon, I would like to welcome Esther Egobanian, we, we, who is a member of the CEDO uh, from Nigeria. And uh, I would like to applaud her. Uh, <laughs> Esther, uh, it would be great to, to hear you just uh, one minute or two. Uh, yes, I apologize for my past the work, but I'm here. I'm so delighted we're able to have this conversation because getting a framework that speaks about parity is what we need. Uh, we found that quotas hardly work. The countries with quotas are making very, very slow progress. And while we have um, been able to record um, political will for other forms of leadership uh, that are not democratic, we have not been able to get political leadership to support women as an indicator for determining legitimate governance structures. And that's one of the things that we would like to really put on the table. Thank you. And now I would like to give the floor to the parliamentarian of Lebanon. Uh, thank you so much, but I'm not from Lebanon, I'm from Serbia. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you were, uh, Lebanon was first on my list. Yes, oh, yes, 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 ah, okay. Yes, yes, so, uh, <laughs> I'm from civil society. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so we, we stay with Serbia. Serbia. Aha, Please. Please okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Natasha Tasic Knežević. I'm a member of the parliament uh, in uh, Serbia, and uh, I'm also a member of the board for the minorities and um, uh, minorities' rights. But I'm also in cultural world because I'm an opera singer. Oh. Thank you. I have to say only one thing that uh, women uh, participation in political decision making needs to be seen as a way of building up a democracy society. This is the why the gender equality issue is among for uh, top priorities of the National Assembly of the Republic of Serbia. Why I'm telling you that I'm also a Roma woman. We do, we have um, so social uh, um, plan, and we do have. I said to my colleague, uh, we have a member of the parliament who has uh, disabilities, and uh, she's a top uh, sport uh, player, and she did a great job uh, in that field. So. In Serbia, we are really working uh, for building up uh, the, the gender issue, not only in the parliament, but also um, among all of us, among the society. Why I'm telling you that uh, Serbian Prime Minister, Anna Brnabic, uh, she brings, um, um, uh, um, what's the name for the internet? Um, uh, we said yesterday. Yes, no, no, no. The, 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 yes, no, not, not artificial intelligence. Uh, she brings up, I'm telling you, I'm just to find that uh, we, we, uh, we said online, yes. Uh, online, online. Uh, uh, digitalization. Mm -hmm. She brings digitalization in Serbia because she believed in digitalization, as I believed in uh, culture that uh, all people who are Roma people, uh, and especially Roma girls, can uh, make their own chances, can make their, they, they can do everything they want if there is possibility to, that, to do that. In all of us, I believe there is a hero. And we have to wake up that hero. And when we wake up that hero, then everything is possible. So 
I'm very happy to be here. I'm <coughs> giving all my efforts to bring only positive things to my country because uh, in Serbia, in National Assembly, we have 35.2% of the women, and seven of them are deputy speakers of the National Assembly. Serbia is really, really great country, mm. and I'm proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> and of women in Serbia. So, uh, I invite you to also give your contribution on the job 40 because uh, IPU is, of course, co-leader of this uh, GR, directly also on our website. Your uh, uh, point of view is very interesting. Thank um, you. Have we another uh, demand from a uh, parliamentarian? <laughs> no, 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 but uh, I, I thought. So, Kenya, no, we go to Lebanon. Kenya. Kenya, Kenya. Lo Lebanon maybe first, because she's waiting for <laughs> Hello, I'm Lonya, uh, from the Chile team for work. As you all know, I'm from Lebanon. And uh, I'm here to amplify the voices of the youth and hope that uh, we can be granted more seats and such round tables. I know we are all uh, pushing towards granting women such seats and, uh, and decision makers round tables. And now it's time to focus and enhance also the youth participation as well. Bearing in mind that currently the youth are playing an important and a valid role in changing regimes and eliminating regimes and changing reforms as well. So this is why taking our opinion into consideration is highly, highly important to proceed with your legal frameworks. So to start with, I would like to emphasize a really important point that we are already uh, aware of some. Basically, in such patriotic uh, systems and societies, we see really low representations of women in parliaments. Uh, their needs, uh, they're not fairly represented. Uh, there's no inclusive diversity into to all, and their specific needs are also not are handed uh, on the table. Hence, this creates um, like a, a problem that does not advance women's empowerment and also influence on decision-making process. <laughs> this is why we have to increase women's representation in parliaments. There are also um, the, there, this would influence uh, the decision-making process as well in order to enhance and empower uh, women and young uh, leaders as well. And this will also take us and lead us to a really important point that I'd like to share with you. It's like, in order to achieve gender parity and inclusive representation, it will take changing legislative laws to enhance gender parity at first, and also to increase women's and youth participation. We're talking about once we are uh, addressing such legislations, laws to be changed, we have to bear in mind that also as well the, their implementations, transparency and accountability. And please, there is being an easy use of the word accountability. It's a really hard word that should be taken seriously, but it's not. It's, it's becoming so easy to add, okay, and it, we will hold you accountable. Accountability, accountability, but no actions have been taken. This is why we have to emphasize and clarify what we mean by accountability. What are the measures that we have to take to hold whoever violates any of the legal frameworks or recommendations or laws, how we will hold them accountable to stop more violations against women and against our women. Thank you. I would like to also proceed with a few questions for Mrs. Nicole. Um, in hoping that you can please take these questions into consideration and share with the member of the committee of SEDA. And um, some of the few questions that I've written, I'm sorry, it's on a short notice. I received this invitation yesterday at night, so I was trying to put my remark as soon as possible. But there's a, quite a lot. First of all, um, have you ever or are currently working towards ending estates or parliaments reservations over SEDA? This is number one. And number two, 
like to rephrase it more, on how do you aim on eliminating discrimination against women with allowing reservations on such conventions? I mean, we're all working here towards eliminating discrimination against women, and this is where we have low and slow progress and increasing because we have such reservations that allow other states and other parliaments to, to hold that against women and other uh, women in all diversity in order to proceed. So we have to start working on framing, uh, I'm hoping that this will be answered in the 2040, uh, sorry, uh, in the upcoming legal framework. And then this will proceed on the CEDAW Convention ratified by 189 states. But I doubt, and I know that you are all aware that they are ratified, but they are not fairly implemented. So uh, what are the actions to be taken to be able not to consider ratifying is enough? Just to say that we have ratified such convention, but what are the actions? What are the measures? Are, are they are monitoring? Are there are? I know we have uh, several committees that are monitoring our, the work, but are they really credible? Are they really monitoring? Is there any evaluations? And then, what are the procedures, the measures? And then, a tip I would like to share with everyone um, to really address: it's about the quota. I mean, we're all here working on increasing the quotas by 30 and 33 percent, and even more. It's a great number to work towards and achieve, knowing that we have really low numbers to start with. But we have to bear in mind that such political and conservative parties are working towards such quotas. For example, Lebanon is a great example of that. They're pushing towards quotas for their own political agendas and, and uh, like influence in what aspect. We have no law in our constitution that permits women's participation. We can have 100% participation of women in the parliament, and we have no awareness of that, because they are working towards not educating, educating the society and women, in, and not just Lebanon, in several countries, not to understand their role in society, their political role and political participation. I know I am short on time, but I hope that these points will be further addressed. Thank you. Thank you. that uh, you'll be elected, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> but uh, I, I would like to, to, to respond on, on the CEDAW committee, but um, uh, I, I leave the floor also to uh, the ambassador about uh, the coalition uh, on, uh, of the Forum Generation Equality, because it's totally integrated in our view. Uh, for the CEDAW, in, in two, uh, uh, two points, uh, yes, we ask for uh, the, the lift of all forms of reservations. And this morning, uh, I take uh, uh, into consideration the, the speech of the High Commissioner, uh, who said, um, "Who said? Uh, let me see something else clear. Women's equality is not going to destroy the institution of marriage, the family, or religion, as some claim. So it's clear uh, there is no reason to oppose." Uh, of course, uh, women's rights and religion or uh, anything else. And we, we give uh, our best to convince the state parties to have a <coughs> strong dialogue with, uh, for instance, uh, religious leaders to really to understand that there is no opposition between women's rights and uh, uh, religion. But often, often it's uh, just an excuse. And we have really to reinforce our efforts. But um, considering the second point, it, it will be a little bit long to explain, but we have regularly uh, constructive dialogues with. Uh, constructive doesn't mean uh, hazy. Uh, it's really very strong dialogue with the state parties. And really, we, we see that in many states, we have now laws against violences. You are absolutely right. The implementation, the effective right uh, is very important, but nevertheless, there is a global progress. But um, I think that if women were in capacity to decide for themselves, um, of course, women's rights will be more uh, easily implemented. So it will be also a part of our GR. Please, would you uh, add something? If you want to. Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the opportunity.
opportunity. My name is Veronica Maina. I'm a senator in the Republic of Kenya, specially elected, that is nominated, courtesy of the gender quota. I think gender quota is a good idea for many nations where it's been very difficult to get women into serious uh, governance and leadership positions. In fact, if you ask me, if it wasn't for the gender quota, many of us would never step into that parliament. In our country, we have a constitution that affirms the two-part gender principle. Under Article 81 and Article 27 of our constitution, women are, are allowed to enjoy the gender quota of two-third principle, the two-third gender principle where the leadership must not occupy spaces beyond two-third when they belong to one gender. So courtesy of that principle, many women have found themselves into public <coughs> office in our country. And in our constitution, uh, we have 47 counties in the nation, and we have 47 women representatives who are members of parliament. We have seen many of those women, after one or two terms serving in parliament, being able to now contest and compete with men for constituencies in places where men and women can compete. So we have seen the quota work. And for some nation, nations, those, that affirmative action is so important. I also want to say this. Uh, we had our uh, chief justice and the deputy chief justice, uh, those that won those positions were women. And you know, when they took up that position, there was almost an uproar in the nation from some of the people with the uh, patriarchal male, patriarchal tendencies. Uh, they were thinking now the judiciary will collapse because it's two women who are at the top and the registrar, the chief registrar, uh, was also, it's also a woman. We waited and the sky did not collapse. <laughs> women, make, women make equal leaders just as good as men and they, they bring a value proposition to the table. So for those who would think that gender quota does not work, maybe it should not work in places where women and men are able to compete at equal parts. But in some places where voting pattern goes towards patriarchal pattern, then you have to consider affirmative action. In our nation now there is a discussion that uh, we should remove the 47 women representative. And women have said no. I have served as a secretary general of the ruling party. And one of the things we did just before the elections as women was to negotiate a women's charter with, with the incoming political parties. We said, if we are voting for you, can you promise to give us half the cabinet? Can you imagine we got it? Wow. We went for the cabinet. Yes. So blindly. Mm -hmm. Teach your women to vote where there is a negotiation yes. on the table. Mm -hmm. Once you get your negotiation, even if you aim for the sun and you reach the moon, at least you made an effort and that effort paid off something. So I think women should negotiate. I think women should not wait for someone to bring that to the table. Yes. Make an effort and work towards it. And then if we eliminate uh, the digital violence, online violence, then women will speak louder, will speak more, will be hard, and people will be able to see the value proposition that women bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Women bring value to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, we should no longer have women treated as flower girls. Mm -hmm. But let me say this. I, I really appreciate that I've had the opportunity to come here. A few years ago, I would not have thought I'm coming to CSW. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to see a live link with the CEDO. You know CEDO, I did it in my master's program as a treaty, a covenant, a booklet, something on the libraries and on the shelves and online resources. But now I have seen the real life CEDO that is changing the life of women. And we have a lot of policy documents right now. I do not think the world is lacking in policy or paperwork or legislated things. What we are lacking and what we need to affirm is implementation of what is on paper. If every nation was to implement, I think we would have a lot more. In Kenya, we are doing a gender bill. We have once again negotiated that when uh, the men are meant to get uh, some funding, we are also going to get a quota for gender in parliament. So we'll have more women in parliament. Wow. Yes. Uh, Thank you so much. Happy International Women's Day. Yeah. I can't think of a better place to spend it than in this room right now.
My name is Vicky Ford from the UK. Um, I wanted to tell you two <coughs> things about women standing for Parliament in the UK, where you may have a similar experience. The first is an observation. We found that if you ask a man to stand for Parliament, you say, we think you'd be a good member of Parliament, would you stand? He usually goes straight home that night and gets on the internet and fills out the application form to join the party and become a member of Parliament. But if you say to a woman, we think you'd be a great member of Parliament, would you stand? She goes home and she thinks, but what about the children, the family, my job? And on average, you have to ask a woman three times to stand before she fills out that form. So we run a campaign in the United Kingdom cross-party called Ask Her to Stand to remind all of us who are elected to keep asking the women to come forward. But the second thing we found out is that women, when they become elected to our parliament, they don't stay as long as the men. On average, it's a fact that a woman member of the British Parliament serves a whole term less than the average of the men. So this is why it's so important to keep looking at the issues that women face and retaining women MPs when you've got them. In particular, this is why the work that the IPU has done about violence against women is really critical. There's a lot of my women colleagues in the Westminster Parliament who are really scared about the potential for violence in the next general election. And that's why I'm looking forward to the IPU and others doing some analysis of recent elections, what's worked to counter that violence and to keep them calm so that we can try and have safe, secure democracy in all of our elections. Thank you. Violences and stereotypes uh, stay obstacles. We have a last question from here. Please. Uh, Could, would, would you use my. Uh, okay. uh, Georgiana Epole, I'm from Romania. Uh, we've been talking here about gender parity and uh, the ambition to see parity in decision making fora. Um, I have a question for you with regards to uh, legislative proposals that are less ambitious than that. Um, that propose um, having um, quotas that do not really reach 50%. How are we looking at those? Is, is that uh, enough in order to see the acceleration that you are talking um, about? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a good question. I, I think the last one. Uh, here, and we stop now. Good morning, everyone. I'm Virginia Pishkin. I'm Alf Italian, Alf Iranian. And uh, I want to comment on uh, this beautiful panel and this very interesting issue. Achieving equality and in decision making means giving the space to women and supporting women who need it. But if we look at the Iranian women, they have been frontliners in more than 40 years under this regime. If we want to encourage women decision making position, they need you support and voice. What can you from IPU do more concretely? Because this regime in Iran is not an option. And more than ever, we saw that this uh, institutionalized misogyny took automatically, pushed down women in a position of second class citizens. So how long like uh, women's society and uh, like people of Iran has to wait these concrete steps? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you can probably uh, say something about that. You know that uh, Iran is not part of the CEDO. Unfortunately, we have four countries out, and including Iran. But the courage of the girls 
are important. And I just want to say that if we succeed in this global push on parity, it can have a, a concrete influence on all the countries. And it's my view, because uh, we cannot, uh, again, we cannot, uh, we cannot just wait. wait. Yes. Um, so thanks, thanks a lot to, to everybody. I would like to give the floor rapidly, and you, 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 you uh, will be the last, to Mariana, maybe. You, you start to a uh, small wrap up and the uh, conclusions uh, uh, of this side event. Thank you. Just to respond to the question from Romania about the 30%, yes. uh, just to mention that uh, we are extremely satisfied that CSW 65 uh, has aligned with the position that the CEDAW committee have been pushing for. We have a 2016 resolution that our member parliament has adopted unanimously say, give yourself a timeline to achieve at least 30% and ultimately the objective of reaching 50%. Uh, it's difficult to imagine that overnight, out of the no quota, you would get a country with 50% quota. That we've seen that happen, but that's quite unusual. So we, 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 we do pursue 50-50. I think now we are all aligned, CEDO Committee, UN, IPU. This is what we will get. Uh, but as the MP from Kenya mentioned quite uh, uh, concretely, sometimes you need to negotiate. And if you can get the 30% as a first step, that's not the final and ultimate goal anymore uh, in terms of international standard. That's all I wanted to share in that regard. Thank you, and uh, of course it's not a final step. Um, please, yeah. Well, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, on uh, the question from Iran, what can we do? What can IPU do? What can parliaments do for, for Iran? Um, I think we will use the Bahrain um, session that we have next week to present something that the Italian parliament is doing, which is a mechanism of sponsorship of people that have been convicted uh, as a consequence of the demonstration uh, and even condemned to death. Each member of parliament has adopted, and we have more than 80 members of parliament that have done it, have adopted one person that is convicted uh, in connection with the demonstration and is pushing with the Iranian embassy, and best friend of the Iranian ambassador that we not see for We are pushing for the relief of individual people, and, and especially people that have been condemned to that, and it's a good time at the IPU to present this, which we are doing together with the Bundestag and, other, and the Canadian parliaments and other parliaments, and to invite other parliaments, other members of parliament, to do that. So, second thing that I'd like to say, and Mariana suggested, and I think it's important for members of parliament and activists that are around here, the IPU has a very good mechanism, which is the Committee for the Human Rights of Parliamentarians. Many members of parliament don't know it. Um, and, I mean, the quality of a democracy in a, in, a, in a country is measured by the way members of parliament are treated. And we're not speaking about privileges, we're not speaking about uh, extraordinary things, but there are lots of, of countries where being a member of parliament, and moreover, being a female member of parliament, is very dangerous. And it, I think it's very important that there is an international mechanism with, that is a peer mechanism. Other members of parliament oversee this mechanism for the quality of the way members of parliament are treated. Some members of parliament are in jail. Some other members of parliament are, are being ousted by, of their seat. Other members of parliament uh, are sexually harassed. Others suffer for what they say, for the position they, they take. So it's very important that everyone here knows that this mechanism works, it meets three times a year, it is serious work, it is something that members of parliament or other people can appeal for members of parliament that disappear, that have been killed in connection with their work. And there are lots of cases that of course have to do with women. We spoke a lot about how to defend the leadership, how to increase the leadership, and I think this is a very important mechanism. That Thank you very much. And the last word is Madame Ambassador. Thank you very much, Nicole. I think that the, I would say several points very quickly. I think that the fact that we are here today means that the magic word here is consistency. 
Consistency means that we can need that we need to work step by step, but all along the way, every minute, every opportunity that we have. So we have heard here about working with grassroots civil society. Super important. The youngs being, you know, involved and becoming more involved in decision making. Uh, legislation laws that needs that need to be passed. Education, education, education means a lot and that will be the transformational tool. And the last word is that women need to be at the top for one reason. They could make this world a better place, a more prosperous one, and a more peaceful one. So women need to be belong where decisions are being made. And we need to keep on working in this regard. So even um, Campaigns like the one we heard from our British colleague ask her to stand from every point, from every single entity, place, the uh, parliament, these meetings, from everywhere we are. We need to keep on being together and working together. And here we are. So happy International Women's Day to all. And uh, just two words, uh, parity now. <laughs>